Hey there, and welcome to Into the Terminal, episode 49. We are talking about Cloudinit as we continue our uh, system provisioning system provisioning episode arc. Joining me today is Nate Lager. And uh, Nate, we're going to be hanging out in your home lab today. So why don't you talk to us about, uh, about Cloudinit and what we're going to be doing? All right. So uh, I've got a machine in my basement. It's a little REL hypervisor. I shouldn't say little, rather beefy, to be honest. Um, ignore the host name. That's just my tongue in cheek way of uh, talking about the chaos that virtualization can bring. <laughs> but uh, in order to make my deployments repeatable, even though it's just a home lab, I'm not some big enterprise or whatever. Um, I came up with an image builder image that I like to use to basically like clone that image every time I need to build a new, um, a new system. Right. So I made a little script. In Roots Home Directory, I'm in, in bin, right? I use this thing called MKVM. You can see it here. And I hate myself, so I made it mixed case because, you know, <laughs> everything should be mixed case, so you typo it the first time. So this is really simple, right? All it, Literally all it does, it uses vert customize to take some command line input to take a disk image and clone it, right? But as we were preparing for this episode, we thought, Let's make that a little more automatic. So I started working on a new script here. I've just called it ITT-CI, um, which is basically, I took my old script, I added some comments here so we can see what's going on, and I added a vert install command to the end of it here. You see me highlighting here. And uh, we'll walk through what each of these pieces do later. But the important thing to notice is this here. It says cloud in it, user data, right? This points to, this is actually a file although it's in the working directory the script goes to, so there's no path call out there. But there's actually a file there that will add a user for us at the end of the cloud init. So what I thought I'd do for the first part of the show here is we'll just, we're going to run this, and you can see the command output as we're going, right? So ITTCI, we just give it a uh, the name of a, of a VM we wanted to build. So I don't know, we'll call it ITT0, right? And what this Sounds is going to do is... It's going to take that and it's going to make us a new VM in, this is a, a KVM libvert box, right? So there we go. You see it says it's uh, it's cloning that, uh, that disk image. Now it's using that, um, the command I showed above to, it basically sets the host name and it sanitizes some things within the image and then it makes a new VM out of it. And then vert install is now actually installing that image, right? And you'll see here the command line, or I should say the terminal output. You might recognize this as basically it's booting a VM right now. So mm -hmm. uh, we could sit and watch this, or we can uh, wait a little bit here. We'll see Cloud and it doing its thing. Yeah, well, well, this runs. Let's let's add a little context to uh, to what's going on here. Uh, the last time sure Nate and I were hanging out, we were talking about Kickstart. Uh, which is one of the many ways that you can actually go in and provision a system. So what we're talking about today, cloud in it is kind of that step two. Uh, so whether you're using Kickstart or in the case uh, of today's episode, uh, we're using an image builder image. Uh, we're talking about once once you have an operating system laid down, how do you layer on top of that the users, the uh, the registration if you're running a rel box, um, package installs, that kind of thing. Cloud init is one of the tools that you can use to get to that next layer of uh, automated customization. Um, cloud init, a lot of times you'll see on uh, on the hypervisors or um, or some of the uh, some of the cloud providers. Uh, DigitalOcean uses cloud init. AWS images use cloud init. Um, and there's a user data section where you can actually define your user, yep. append an SSH key. So a lot of times when you see that in a in a graphical configuration uh, where it says name your user, put in a password, uh, add your SSH key. What it's, what it's doing is it's just collecting that information and it's actually underneath underneath the covers, what you're seeing is it's actually using cloud init underneath to, to populate those users, to add in those packages, uh, to attach that SSH key. <coughs> right. Yeah, that, that's basically just passing straight into cloud init. And you can also do things like specify host names and whatnot. I didn't need to because that was all handled by the image, but uh, yeah. So what we can do is after the break, we are going to actually log into this machine and show you that the uh, the user that we added works, and then we'll show you how CloudInit works, and maybe we'll do some customizations to how CloudInit can further customize this machine after install. 
Perfect. So as we transition into the second part of the show, that is, of course, the time to get your questions into chat. Join us live on Twitch and YouTube. And, and uh, as along with taking your questions, we are definitely going to be uh, seeing if we can't get Nate's script to break uh, as we uh, add some customizations to Cloudinet. All right, so Nate, welcome. You you're becoming a uh, a staple on into the terminal. Yeah, it seems that way. This and roll presents. I mean, just, uh, you guys just keep pulling me in the last last second whenever we need something, right? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I gave you like four days' notice this time, not two hours. Yeah, which is good because I needed a little bit of prep for this one. <laughs> yeah, we're about to, digging through the docs on this one, but uh, yep. yeah, great, yep. great to have you. This is, of course, episode forty-nine of Into the Terminal. Uh, we'll be off for the holidays next week, uh, and then Nate, you and I will actually be on site at uh, AWS Reinvent. Uh, all. Yep be in the air so i'll be at about thirty-two thousand feet uh, about the time that into the terminal is live so uh scott mcbrien will be flying solo on that one um unfortunately maybe i won't can, be able to connect and, and give him a hard time maybe we can try to watch live from the airplane i don't know if that's a thing <laughs> <laughs> but yeah episode funny, 49 it's it's, it's kind of sad i'll miss episode 50 but uh you know uh, all in all uh scott will probably look forward to uh uh, to flying solo, he used to be the sole host of Into the Terminal Dark Mode, which was our our second showing of this episode uh, of of our content. Uh, but before we dive back into the terminal, pun intended, um, wanted to share a free public service announcement that as of this week, Rel nine point one, eight point seven, and Satellite six point twelve all went GA over the last three days. So if you're running RHEL 8, uh, 8.7 is available for update. Uh, if you're running RHEL 9, like most of our labs are, um, you can now update to RHEL 9.1. And then uh, for our satellite uh, users out there, 6.12 is amazing. <coughs> Excuse me. So we've actually got episodes of RHEL Presents uh, covering both, uh, both of those products in December and into January. So definitely check out RHEL Presents for that. And but, I'll... Uh... Uh, I'll just say that for all of you sysadmins out there who uh, just got a bunch of release notes and a bunch of notices <laughs> and a bunch of now I've got a patch, sorry. <laughs> but it had to be done. <laughs> right. Although we do tell you it's it's every six months now. so Yeah, you can plan on these ho things. Hopefully every time it's less and less of a surprise. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait. They met their they met their release cycle again. We did again. <laughs> We're going to have to get a board going on on the website that says this many releases without missing a date. Yeah, yeah, but it's boring when you always hit it. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, and and Steve in the chat points out that Fedora thirty seven also dropped this week. It did. Um, so that that kicked off my my home uh, home technology uh, updates for the week. So I had yep. two laptops running Fedora thirty six, actually a th Fedora thirty six and a Fedora thirty seven beta. Uh, that both were updated. So lots of updates this week. Thankfully, you have the Thanksgiving holiday to go in and patch all your stuff um, when you're uh, half asleep on the couch watching uh, watching football and eating turkey. So uh, <laughs> foot, football is a game in, in the United States, Nate, that they throw a ball around and try and score points. Oh, you mean hand egg? Yes, that. That too. <laughs> All right, before we derail our episode any further, let's dive back in and let's see what uh, what happened with uh, with our CloudInit uh, image builder system. Yep, so here we are back at the same old terminal we started before. No, no magic has happened since then. It's been sitting here just idle. Now, uh, we'll show you in the CloudInit in a minute, but I, I basically made Eric uh, an account uh, using CloudInit on my machine. So this is, I, I, I made it just IT guy Eric. And we're going to log in with it to show you that CloudNet actually did its thing, right? And I gave it a password. You'll you'll find out what it is later. <laughs> oh, gosh. I've, I feel some trolling of the host coming. And there we go. And in the CloudNet, I told it to make Eric part of the wheel group so that he could do pseudo things. So we can just do like, uh, I don't know, pseudo. And you can see he's got pseudo access without uh, without password requirements, which is exactly the way I expected it to be. Now, what we're going to do here is I didn't do much else with CloudInit here. So first, we're, we're just going to uh, log back out of this terminal and then break out of the terminal session so we can get back to the hypervisor. Right. And um, let's see here. We're going to go to 
So this is just where I stored the the Cloudinate files. Not Etsy. I'm sorry. It's in Marlib. This is where I keep all my disk images. And just because it was convenient for pathing and whatnot, I put the user data file right here. So if we cat the user data file, you'll see uh, we've got system info, default user, IT guy Eric. I gave it a password. And uh, we're not locking the account out. And we made him <laughs> a part of Wheel. Awesome. Love okay, the password. Okay, so, right. And so what happens here is basically Cloudinit is a service that runs on, I think it's just on first boot. I think after it does its first, uh, the first initial run, it actually disables it so that people can't try to leverage it later to try to add in additional users and whatnot. So Cloudinet is a service that gets installed, it runs the first time the system boots, and then it's then it's disabled. Um, what you can do with Cloudinet though, is um, with, with things like OpenStack, for example, there's actually a metadata service that runs within OpenStack, which serves Cloudinit. So you don't need a file somewhere. You just give it to OpenStack, and OpenStack puts it in this metadata service. And then when you run a VM, it brings it in. Um, our, our old hypervisor offering, Rev, that did the same thing. Um, AWS, like cloud providers like that, they have services that will make it work. I presume it's a similar setup where they run this little metadata service, or maybe they pass it in text. I don't know. Uh, you can't really tell what goes on behind the scenes in your cloud provider. But... Just understand that it works the same way. This same format will work for uh, for other providers if they give you this level of access. Now, with RHEL, we have a pretty extensive set of documentation on what else you can do with Cloudinit, right? And um, Eric, I don't know if we can put that in the show notes or whatever so that people can see it, or maybe if you can put share it on the screen so people can go look. But um, one of the interesting things I found that you can do with with this is you can also make it register the system with um, with the customer portal at install mm -hmm. time. And then, of course, if you can do that, you can then install packages and whatnot as well. But we're going to step back for just a second here, and we're going to go through the command that I used to instantiate this so we, we can kind of walk through what exactly we were doing here, right? You have any comments there, Eric, while I'm getting this going? Um, so uh, why don't we... Uh... Actually, never mind. Um, so yes, the uh, the links to some documentation as well as our uh, end of the terminal episode on Kickstart will both be in the show notes. Uh, it usually takes me a couple of hours after the show goes live to, to get that populated, but uh, definitely check the show notes for some links. We also had an interesting suggestion to uh, to have like a Git repository somewhere publicly available for show content. So that was kind of an interesting idea. Um, that uh, that Steve Cassidy had, so we we may look into that uh, after the Thanksgiving break and uh, there you go. and see if we can't get some kind of a community build going. Um, <clears throat> and then before we dive into the script here, we did have a question from Luna. Sure thing. <clears throat> uh, let me pull that up. And uh, so Luna noticed that in in the uh, Cloud Init configuration that the password was was in plain text. Uh, so can the password be encrypted with SHA-256 or something along those lines? They can be passed in as a hash, I believe. And you can also add something like an SSH key. Or you could mm -hmm. probably leave the password locked and require SSH authentication, which is the way I would prefer it. Uh, for the sake of the demo, I wanted to keep it as simple as possible. But yeah, you have lots of options there. Yep. Awesome. So let's let's walk through what uh, what your script is doing. Sure. So a lot of this isn't necessarily Cloudinet related, but I wanted to give you an idea of what exactly I did with that nice little script at the beginning. Uh, so there's no real hand waving going on here, right? So first of all, as I mentioned, I built this using I built the image that I clone using Image Builder. Uh, so I did it, I think, locally, but you could also do it through the hybrid cloud console. You define I defined an image, I gave it a partition table I liked, I added my own user in that way, uh, just because at the time, I wasn't thinking about toying with cloud in it. So my user is baked into it. You could do that with like an administrative user or like an Ansible user, for example. Uh, or you can do it all with cloud in it. So I have that image. It's just sitting in the var lib libvert images directory on my hypervisor, which is where libvert by default keeps its, its image store, right? So you can see here at the beginning of the script, we just switched to that directory. That's what pushd does. And I echo, you know, just like some output so we know what's going on. This is just copying the file. I named it cloneme.qcow2, so I didn't have some big long uh, UUID to deal with, which is what Image Builder will give you. Yep. 
Uh, and then I just made a copy. See, I'm using $1 here. That's command line input from the bash script. Anyone who's not familiar with bash scripting, this isn't going to be a how-to on bash scripting, but just know that $1 is the first thing you've typed after the name of the script on the command line, right? Uh, also, you might notice at the beginning, I even added error checking, right? If you didn't, if you didn't give me a, a command line input, it it'll basically exit the script saying you need to tell me what the VM name should be. All right, so uh, after that, we're using vert customize. Now, vert customize, you'll find this right inside of our documentation for image builder. If you look up on the customer portal, how to use an image builder image to uh, build a, a, a libvert VM, it'll tell you to use vert customize. So vert customize uh, dash a basically tells it like this is the name of the, 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 the I have to look up actually dash a. I forget why I added that in there. I think that's that's telling it what scripts or what not what script what um, what disk image to what disk image to base it on or yeah what disk image to customize right and the, there's that dollar one again that's just the name of the VM we gave it I gave it disk zero so that if later I want to add another disk to this thing they're already in a nice little uh, easy to name array and then I tell it what host name to set because Vert Customize will go into the image and set the host name within the, the OS, which is kind of cool. Uh, then I fix some ownership. That's just basically uh, POSIX permissions there. And this is the key here, vert install. Vert install is a command line that tells libvert, I want to install a VM. Like here's here's the, the, the basics that I need. I gave it a name. I gave it some memory. I gave it some CPUs. I told it to base it on RHEL 9, which is basically telling KVM to optimize it for RHEL 9. There's a whole bunch of definitions within KVM that'll optimize it for different versions. Uh, and then uh, import. I don't remember what import was for, but it's there. It needed to be there. The clock offset was important because so this the, tells. Sorry, so go ahead. Dash 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 import tells it to uh, to import into the list of available virtual machines. There um, you go. So this, like, uh, like dash dash import is what's running under the hood when you use the web console to create or import a an existing right. uh, an existing disk. There we go. And I would have used the web console, but for whatever reason, CloudNet isn't built into the web console yet. Let's go tell Brian, right, that he needs to get that worked in there, right? Anyway, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the clock offset, this was important so that when the system it comes up, it's using my local time and it's not trying to change it for UTC. Because if you want to do package installs or pretty much anything, right, you need the time synchronized if it wants to do any sort of uh, comparisons or say you're registering with uh, like a Kerberos um, uh, identity store, the time needs to be synced. This is just one more way to make sure that that's, that's good to go at instantiation time. Then we tell it what disk to use. And here's the, here's the magic, cloud init, user data. There's also one for metadata, which can let you specify certain system specific things, but I'm just passing in user data. And this is of course where that, that file was, the user data file. All right, does that make sense? <laughs> Sounds good I hope to it me. Makes sense, right? And then here's my little <laughs> thing that says you need to tell me what uh, what the system name is, otherwise I can't do anything, right? If you didn't specify one, it kicks you back out. All right. I'm so glad to see I'm not the only one that uses image builder images and a bash script with vert install in order to uh, to carry out uh, my my lab provisioning. Right, and it works well. And the the neat thing is, if you have the web console open, looking at your VM list, and you run vert install. It's practically instantaneous. The second this yep. thing is is defined, it shows up in there. And it, that's kind of amazing. When you think about where web, web applications and where system configuration web applications lived even five years ago, right? This stuff is like magic. <laughs> <laughs> or way back in the day when you had to do all of this by hand every single time. Yeah, yeah. Well, th this is the reason I usually go to Bash Scripts because this is the way I've done it forever because you didn't have cool little web UIs to get this stuff done with. All right, so we're not gonna take any changes to the script here because we don't need to, and that's kind of the beauty of CloudInit, right? Now, sorry, my dogs are going crazy. This one's gonna go in a second. You can see her, she's like, wait, wait, what, should I bark? Okay. <laughs> All right, so now I'm still back in that images directory where the CloudInit file is, the user data file, right? We're gonna edit the user data file. There she goes. Nope, there Hang we on. Go. 
the joys of of running a live stream. Live I knew that was going to happen. I I just knew it. It's, I knew that as soon as anything happened out there that triggered the dogs, that one was going to go crazy. All right. Of course. So where was I? We're going to edit the file. All right. So this, as you can see, we showed it before. This is just the user definition. What we're going to do is we're going to extend what we're doing here by also adding in some subscription data, right? So we're going to use RH subscription, which I don't know if this is a customization we do or if this is in the cloud and it's standard. So, you know, I don't know if you can use this on cloud providers and whatnot, but it's in our documentation. I assume RHEL will respect it. So there it is. Uh, we, we've given an, an activation key and organization ID, and we're going to delete these as soon as the show's over. So don't try to reuse these. <laughs> <laughs> that, we're going to tell it up my, my, uh, yeah. uh, developer subscription. So we're, uh, yeah, right. We're going to tell it to <laughs> auto attach to the subscriptions that, you know, it should get based on whatever <laughs> activation key Eric defined for us here. And then we're going to install package. This is like my go-to default package because it's such a common one that people might want to build out of the box, you know, a web server or, you know, something like that, some, some core service like that. So now we're just going to save this. And now if we build another VM, so we're going to do, what was the name of the script? ITTCI. We're going to give it a new name, ITT1, since we already built ITT0. We don't want to just rebuild the same box because we didn't delete the old one. That, that's and that's incredibly, incredibly clever naming convention there. I yeah, right. Well, you know, zero. All number schemes have to start at zero. So, you know, <laughs> zero and one. <coughs> so here it goes. Going to do the same thing we did earlier. Then it gets us to the virtual console, right? Now, normally, and in fact, uh, I don't want to mess around with switching uh, my share here, but if you were to go to the web console at this point and go to your VM mm -hmm. management, you can see all the same output in the console there as well, right? So that I thought that was kind of neat when I tried this out. So, it, you know, if you were doing this yourself and you weren't trying to demo it, you could just switch over to the web console and watch this. In fact, there may be command line options that'll tell you to output this on the terminal. So that's yeah, you know, so. kind of in the background. All right, so it finished the install, but now the package install doesn't happen until after the system is fully booted. And uh, you might know that there's probably still some things going on in the background that aren't outputting at the moment. Once they finish, then CloudInit is going to run the subscription, you know, the register that we told it to do, and then it's going to install the package. Mm -hmm. So we just need to give it a minute here. There we go, updating subscription management. Yep, and that's the nice thing about watching the uh, terminal output. There's no yep. sitting there waiting at your keyboard to see if you can SSH to your new box over and over and over again until it finally right. uh, until it finally lets you in. <coughs> While that's running, uh, Shantanu asks, does RHEL play a part in enhancing the cloud init spec upstream? If so, the spec could work on different clouds, I guess. That, I don't know if I have an answer for it. I would, you know, that's generally the way we do do things. Although there are certain things that are rel specific, like subscription management, maybe, I don't know if, if there's any value in putting those back upstream. So, so standard procedure for rel development is to start with the upstream. So if it's something that could benefit everyone, uh, we do our code work in the upstream. Uh, in fact, that's one of the reasons why Fedora sent to us stream uh, are both ahead of RHEL in the development lifecycle now. Um, <clears throat> we do a lot of work uh, with the Fedora community uh, with the expectation of that kind of filtering through uh, to RHEL. So with, uh, so that's part one is um, is start with the upstream. Part two is when in, when packages get to RHEL, we usually take a fork of at this point CentOS stream and adds rel specific bits to it so things like uh things like red hat or rh <coughs> things like rh subscription isn't going to be beneficial to anyone except red hat so uh, <coughs> so what uh what we would do is we would add those red hat bits into the red hat package version of cloud dash init 
but I imagine some of the more generic subscription manager utilities are out there because uh, other uh, distributions like SUSE and Ubuntu use uh, CloudInit as well. So probably the more generic subscription manager stuff goes upstream, but um, but some of the Red Hat specific stuff just lives in the uh, Red Hat specific um, version of CloudInit. Long-winded explanation. <coughs> Although uh, James says uh, that Red Hat subscription does work in the upstream, so I didn't, there you didn't go. realize that. But there yeah, you go. yeah, that's that's what we get for trying to go off the cuff, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I always talk about generalities. I also noticed that Shantanu uh, caught me on my time sync <laughs> statement. I may have misspoke there. Okay, so when I did that vert install, and I told it to set the time to local time, what I should have stated was something more like. This is telling the installed VM that it doesn't need to offset itself from the time on the hypervisor, right? The hypervisor is set to my local time. Therefore, anything that I do in the VM now should match what's on the hypervisor's time. And therefore, it shouldn't be out of sync, right? It, it's not synced in the same state that like <laughs> NTP would have synchronized it. Mm -hmm. NTP would have started after the system was up and running and synchronized with an actual NTP server. But what I was trying to accomplish there was if you try to do a package install, and I ran into this before the show and I was worried I wasn't going to be able to do the package install <laughs> during CloudInit. But if the time is not within a relatively close sync to where you're actually claiming to be, uh, the package installs will fail because of an SSL negotiation problem, because the time is too far out of sync, right? And I could go a lot deeper on that, but I really don't feel like I, I <laughs> it's a good use of our time today, but it, it comes down to the OCSP uh, protocol or stapling or whatever within uh, the SSL negotiation, right? Or TLS, I guess, negotiation. So anyway, I had to do that to make sure the package install would work is really what it comes down to. So Speaking I'm... of which, oh, sorry, go ahead. So one of the things uh, that I've noticed about the uh, the terminal is sometimes when it's done, it'll just sit there like this. But if mm -hmm. you hit return, yep. uh, it should we should be at a point where it's finished. Yep, this is just like if you were go. at the you were standing at the monitor on your physical machine or looking at the virtual at the VM console. All right, any output kind of overrides that login. But as you hit enter, there you are again. But at this point, we should be able to log in with Eric again his super secure password. Here we are. Now, um, there's probably lots of ways to get this done, but usually when I want to see if a package is installed, I just ask the local RPM database. Yep. So we move through sudo RPM. We're going to list all of our packages and we're going to grep for the package that we're looking for. Again, there's, a lots, there's lots of ways to get this done. Go ahead, put in the chat how you would do it if you want to. <laughs> So HTTPD is the name of the package we told it to install. It should have installed HTTPD in any of its dependencies. So you're going to see more than just one package when we do this. And in fact, in that output we saw up here, I mean, we already know that it's installed because there it is in the output, right? That's the output from YUM or from DNF. So here we go. There it is, Apache, and its uh, its dependencies are already there. Now, there's more you can do with Cloud Init, but you know, this is just kind of an, an introduction. So. Don't worry, I kicked off the trolling in the chat just for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, RPM dash Q. I yeah, that would do it too. I think if you give it the the name of the package, I'm used to trying to use commands that are a little more generalized, so that if I mm -hmm. don't a hundred percent know the name of the package, right? So yes. if that was like if I just typed HTTP, it would have found HTTPD by using grep, right? It's just yep. the way I've learned to do it over the years, all those years as a sysadmin not being 100% sure what you're looking for. Yep. Yeah, I've, I've well trained myself to use pipe grep uh, yeah. in those situations just yep. because, yep. Uh, I mean, for for the early years of being a sysadmin, I always forgot that it was HTTPD, HTTPD. I'd always leave off the D, and then at least by, by doing a search, which is what grep does for HTTP, uh, I could I could still find the packages and then go oh yeah I forgot it was there there's a D on that. <coughs> so that brings us towards the bottom of the hour. There's a couple more questions here in chat that uh, that we'll we'll bring up. Um, 
Topfy asks, I tried to create my own cloud init image by installing the cloud init package, but that broke my interface naming convention from example ENP 6S18 to E0. Is that the case on pre-built images as well? So I don't know the answer, but we can find out. <laughs> if I just do an IPA, right? Or like an NMCLI con show, we should be able to see what the names of our interfaces are. So let's see here. Yep, it's showing E0. Now, I'd have to compare it, I think, to one of my other systems. I don't know why CloudInit would specifically change that, but a lot of times that depends on what the underlying um, interfaces are, right? Mm -hmm. So the fact that I used vert install to make this VM versus the way I would have done it on my previous systems, which would be to use the, um, the GUI within uh, Web Console, those those interfaces may have been defined differently, so it's I can't even compare it to an existing system that I have at the moment. So um, I don't know if I have an answer for you right this second, except that this machine seems to suggest that uh, it does in fact use ETH zero. So it's it's interesting because it seems like virtual and cloud systems still use ETH zero naming conventions, whereas anytime I install something on bare metal, I usually get the uh, I usually get the the longer uh, newer version. I think that I think that naming scheme came out around RHEL 7 time frame, but I mm -hmm. actually haven't sat down and compared one to one. Yeah, I remember it might be as far back as RHEL 6, but it wasn't the default in 6. In 7, it became the default that a lot of administrators had to wring their hands over it. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we've all kind of gotten used to it. And now now we're the other way around, right? If it's not named the the new method and it goes back to ETH whatever, we're upset about it. So, you know, times change, I suppose. But uh, yeah, I, I think we'd have to look into why. Yeah, we, we'd have to look into why cloud and it would change that at all. Uh, to be honest, I, I just don't. I don't have an answer off the top of my head. Yeah. And then one last question it looks like, and that's uh, from Shantanu, and we may need some context around this uh, in chat. Uh, does Rel support vanilla shell cloud in its two? Cloud init supports YAML as well as vanilla shell script. This nuance is not so obvious, hence why I ask. So support vanilla shell cloud in it. Yeah, would... uh, so if you're if you're asking if uh, rel supports uh, shell scripts within uh, the cloud init config, the answer would be yes. Um, so I don't know that it would be in user data. I would think that would well, if you're calling it through user data, then yeah, because you can designate a post script, uh, a post config. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm not exactly sure. Uh, okay, uh, I mean the user data is the shell script itself, but I do know that you can call other shell scripts from user data. It would just be I think it's uh, post dash script or something along those lines. <coughs> I would have to try it. I ha I haven't done it myself. Yeah, I mean even what we covered today was a stretch of of my understanding. Um, the funny thing was, as a sysadmin, um, CloudInit was, I knew just enough CloudInit to fix things after they were broken, because uh, in certain situations, CloudInit wouldn't, it's probably fixed nowadays, but back in back in my time, uh, CloudInit wouldn't always get disabled after initial setup. Uh, and so when you go and try and try and reboot your system, CloudInit would just hang and hang and hang. Um, but now it should disable itself after it runs. Uh, but to this day, just to be safe, I usually, uh, usually part of my post install is to, uh, process is usually to, uh, uninstall the cloud init package once that system has been provisioned, just in case something weird, um, just in case something weird happens and cloud init gets re-enabled. Yeah, that's probably not a bad, a bad way to go. I'm just trying to see here. If uh, if it was disabled on this system, it looks like it's still listed as loaded. It says failed because each time it runs, it gets this one, this error, right? But it did actually complete. There's also a log you can check that outputs all this stuff into a log, right? But uh, unless I'm missing something here, it looks like it is still enabled. So yeah, you'd probably want to disable it afterward. Maybe put that in a post job or come back and do it with automation later. Or I wonder if I wonder if we rebooted the box if it would then come up as disabled. There may be some kind of before reboot run this task that yeah. So I mean the does. 
the the key here is that the hypervisor, I believe, has to have passed that metadata in somehow, right? Mm -hmm. So even if it is still enabled, it's probably still a good uh, um, good practice to disable it afterward, just to be sure. Uh, but it would be hard, I think, to try to call it in. And again, I'm I'm going off the cuff here, right? I, I right. don't have any any proof that that is in fact a very difficult. But the paranoid sysadmin in, in me says you should disable or remove the service uh, to make sure it doesn't happen. Right. All right. Well, Nate, thank you so much for for being my my co-host today and uh, for basically writing this lab by yourself late last <laughs> night after doing a like two and a half hour podcast of your own. So thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it was fun, and I actually, I actually learned a thing or two. Right? I, I, I don't generally use CloudInit with Libvirt, so I had to look up how to get that done, and uh, you know, I learned something. So yeah, it was, it was nice because uh, it, it was nice because uh, I, I started working on this. You kind of took over when, when, it, when it was family dinner time for me, and and came up with a few things, and then I was able to fill in a few, few gaps on your side, and so it was <laughs> very much yeah. a collaborative effort for, for uh, Into the Terminal this week. So yep. thank you so much for joining me. Folks in the live chat, thank you all very much for, for being a part of, the, of today's show. Uh, I know we went a little bit over, but I feel like the conversation was, was well worth the time. Um, if you like the content, please like and subscribe to the RHEL channel. Also share it with a friend. Uh, we are uh, also looking for new ideas ideas for uh for a couple of new episode arcs uh we'll be wrapping up our troubleshooting arc by the end of the year uh i'll have nate on first episode of the new year to to cover image builder which i think pretty well rounds out our uh provisioning arc that we've got i mean into the terminal is getting heavy duty man we've got not one but two episode arcs going simultaneously yeah and we're going to have to hire some people just to do just to do the live streams okay maybe Suited. But soon it's going to get just as confusing as Lost was when they started doing those time shifts. Oh, please don't do that. To me. No, no, no. no. <laughs> but uh, yeah, join uh, join Scott in two weeks. No, no live streams next week. Join, <coughs> excuse me. Join Scott in two weeks. He'll be talking about troubleshooting network uh, issues. Uh, so you know, our troubleshooting arc is the the irony of we intentionally break things before the show to try and fix them on the show. Uh, so that, that'll be a great episode talking about network configs. Uh, this time it probably won't be DNS because Nate and Scott already fixed DNS. Maybe this time it's... it'll be the firewall. <laughs> there you go. That's always, <laughs> that's always number two. All right, folks. Thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to tell a friend and we'll see you in a few weeks. <clears throat> yep. Have a good one, everybody. <laughs>